Uh, what I want to do today, and I'm really appreciative to have the, the opportunity to share what I've done with you all. What I want to talk about is a book that I just published. It's called The Engaged Scholar. And uh, uh, what I want to do is talk in three parts. Uh, the first, I want to explain why I wrote this book, what I'm trying to do. The second, I'm going to, I don't usually do this, but when I was trying to think about how to summarize the book, the preface summarizes it. So I'm going to read it to you. Um, I think it'll give you a sense of what the book is about, but also the style with which it's written. And then lastly, I have a short slide deck to show you what's in it. I want to make this as complete as possible and allow you to go from there. Um, the book opens with a very simple question. Why did you become a professor or why did you choose to become a professor if you're a doctoral student? And it's an important question that I think many of us lose track of. Um, we start off perhaps with ideas about having an impact on the world around us and then the swirl and the chaos and the pressures of academia, publish or perish, drives us in a direction that some of us may end up in a place and say, how did I get here? This isn't what I wanted to be. And I think that if you don't have a clear idea of what you're trying to do as a professor, you will be forced into a mold and it may not be a mold you want. And so I wanna bring out the idea that some of you, not all of you, but some of you want to have impact in the real world. Some of you want to have impact within the profession, within the literature, and that's fine. I'm trying to broaden the tent of the different ways that one can enact the model of being a professor. That's what I'm trying to do with this book, and I'm trying to provoke a conversation. Ideally, this book, this is my hope, will end up in syllabi for doctoral students uh, as a primer, as a way to get the conversation started. It's designed for that purpose. Um, if you've published books or if you're thinking about publishing books, you always want to think about the press, who their audience is, and the price point. I deliberately chose this series from Stanford University Press. It's called Stanford Briefs. They're meant to be short, they're inexpensive, and, they're, 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 and then they're bulk discounts. So this book is only 133 pages, although it has 28 pages of citations. It's, it's, it's heavily cited. And it's only uh, $14. And there's a 20% discount code, Hoffman20, you can use. There are bulk discounts. You can get this book down to $11, which could easily drop into a syllabus. So what I'm trying to do, as I said, is provoke a conversation and, uh, and get people to think about what is the role of the academic in society today? What is it? What should it be? How do you want to enact the role of professor for yourself? And uh, I'll get into that. So there's my goal in writing it. Uh, I'm going to read the preface. It's 2,300 words, and I looked it up, and the average conversation rate for English speakers in the U.S., according to the National Center for Voice and Speech, is 150 words per minute. I'll bet you didn't know that. So this should take 15, 10 to 15 minutes, and then I'll show you a slide deck of what's in it, and then we'll open up questions. Um, so I hope that works for everybody. So here's the preface, <clears throat> and it'll give you a sense of the style and the focus of the book. Why did you choose to become a professor? There's the opening question right off the bat. When I feel myself losing track of the purpose. Hello, of the oh, they yep. said my battery was going, so now I have to go and plug it. Please, did you have challenges with teams today? I'm sorry, say that. Ah, Moro, could you? What was that? Okay. Should I just keep on going? Okay. Okay, back to where I was. Why did you choose to become a professor? When I feel myself losing track of the purpose or meaning behind my work, I return to this simple question. And my answer is equally simple. I want my research, teaching, and outreach to have an imprint, a positive imprint on the world around me. Citation counts, A-level publications, and an H index pale in comparison to that simple outcome. Yet our award systems elevate these metrics and they don't come close to capturing my deeper purpose. So that leaves it to me to decide what is valuable and important in my academic pursuits. I know that that kind of independence is hard to assert, especially when you're early in your academic career. But as you advance, you have more freedom to exercise your independence. For me, I keep in mind the challenge from Jane Lubchenco, Oregon State Marine Ecologist and former president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, that academic scholars must abide by what she called scientist social contract that they have an obligation to provide a service to society, to give value for their money provided by the public funding, government grants, and tuition revenue. It is an obligation that is born out of both a societal need for the expertise that academics possess and a recognition of the responsibilities that come from the privileged life that academics lead. 
I'm writing this book at a particularly precarious time. The COVID-19 pandemic is wreaking havoc on our lives and our livelihoods. People are suffering and society needs the answers. Yet many people are turning away from science, distrusting its conclusions and its motivations, and even questioning its assessment that the virus is real. This is happening because we are now immersed in an array of confusing and conflicting messages that question facts, blur the line between opinion and fact, and dismiss formally respected sources of information as merely political interests pushing a partisan agenda. This, according to the RAND Corporation, is the existential crisis of our time. If we do not improve the scientific literacy of our public and political discourse, how can we make sense of the challenging issues we face? You can't set policy or make informed decisions about nanotech, stem cell research, nuclear power, climate change, vaccines and autism, genetically modified organisms, endocrine disruption, gun violence, or COVID-19, if you do not agree on a common set of facts to ground the conversation. Now, to my mind, this existential crisis lays the gauntlet at the door of the academy. If academic scholars do not provide the kind of scientifically grounded knowledge that society needs, who will? But the societal crisis is happening at a time when the academy is facing a crisis of its own. Academic research is becoming increasingly irrelevant as the work becomes too insular, the language too opaque, the journals too inaccessible, and the cultural norms of disciplinary boundaries too balkanized. We need to break out of our siloed research communities and bring our work to a world that needs it. In the words of former University of Texas at Austin President Larry Faulkner, the antidote to irrelevance is engagement of the university with the real needs and aspirations of the supporting society. Now, not every academic must take on this role, but this book is a call to make that path more acceptable and legitimate for those who do. To enlarge the tent, to be inclusive of multiple ways that one enacts the role of academic scholar in today's world. Some may prefer to impact in the world of scholarship, but others may wish to have more impact in the world of practice, bringing their insights and knowledge to directly solving the great challenges of our time. While both are needed, Unfortunately, the academic reward system steers people only towards the former. This very book, if you were holding it, this very book that you were holding will not register highly in my annual review because it is not quote unquote academic. A-level publications are the coin of the realm. But if you wanna have impact in the real world, you must take your work beyond the academic publications and bring it to the world of the practice. They will not come to you. An illustration. I recently asked attendees at an academic seminar before COVID to raise their hand if they were concerned about climate change. Everyone did. This was a seminar on, on um, business and sustainability. I asked how many devoted their research to the topic. Most kept their hands up. I asked how many aimed their research at A-level academic publications. All hands re remained raised. I asked how many felt that another A-level academic paper would change how society addressed the issue of climate change. Most hands came down. This is the strange irony in which we find ourselves, and it is an irony that some have begun to question. A new generation of scholars is emerging into the field with a strong desire to make a difference in the real world. This book is for them in particular. Whether they are new PhD students just entering their degree programs, young professors just starting their careers, or mid-career professors who have begun to question the purpose behind their work, my hope is to inspire a career path rooted in rigorous research, but expanded with the goal of relevant impact on practice within society. Even seasoned senior professors may find some value in these pages. It is never too late to consider the measure of your life's work based on meaning and purpose rather than status, however defined. This book is not gonna summarize the entire field of public engagement, but it will offer some coverage of the field while it will offer some coverage of the field, it will chiefly focus on the posture and spirit of adopting engagement as part of your academic portfolio. At times, it may stride into the domain of a polemic, but overall, <clears throat> it will be about amending the types of questions we ask in order to blend rigor and re relevance, redirecting what we do with the answers to bring them to the attention of them, those that need them, and recreating the institutional structures to supporting and accelerating changes in how we create and disseminate research. And it will be about offering hope. I have talked with many PhD students who entered their program with a desire to have real world impact, make a difference, improve society. But just after a couple of years, they feel pushed into a corner and towards disillusionment. I don't want them to let the spark die. 
I want them to hold a vision of their career that strives towards the elusive pastor's quadrant. And I'll explain that later. Public engagement has been the goal throughout my academic career. I study environmental issues because I care about preserving and protecting our natural world. I earned a joint doctoral degree between the schools of business and engineering and was held to that goal by a committee of advisors that included business school professors who asked about the theoretical rigor of my work and engineering professors who kept asking me, what's the point? For me, the point is that I wanna see the impact of my work in the thoughts, values, and behaviors of those I reach in business, policy, and society. My work stands on the shoulders of social theorists who came before me, but I use that theoretical knowledge to understand and change the empirical world and not set a priority to use the empirical world to contribute to theory within the academic literature. <clears throat> and as, I've, I as I have advanced in my career, <clears throat> the balance of my portfolio slowly shifted in its emphasis from academic to public audiences. I still write academic papers, but I write more books intended to span to academic and lay audiences. I take my work to more public audiences through practitioner journals, web essays, radio interviews, talks at business, government, and nonprofit conferences. I even speak to high school students, senior citizen groups, and local community groups. I feel like I'm fulfilling my purpose when someone approaches me after one of my talks to say that I changed the way they thought about an issue or an executive tells me I provided tools that they can use today. I have the same feeling when my books appear in syllabi around the world or assigned a required summer reading for incoming freshmen. Twice I've been invited to give a freshman convocation address and the satisfaction I feel in reaching those young minds far exceeds anything I have felt in reaching my academic peers in the seminar, seminar room. In the end, these activities define the role of the academic for me. And I want to encourage other scholars to do the same when the occasion presents itself. I am a tenured full professor. That means I can do anything I want. I do not intend to cease academic work, but this stage of my career is an opportunity to branch out into domains where I can have real world impact. Why don't more senior faculty use the opportunity to experiment? In the words of one of my colleagues, Andy, a problem with our field is that we have too many senior professors still thinking like junior professors. They chase the same publication counts that they did as junior professors because it feels safe. In the words of University of Michigan President Mark Schlissel, we forget the privilege it is to have lifelong security of employment at a spectacular university. And I don't think we use it for its intended purpose. I think the faculty on average through the generations are becoming a bit careerist and staying inside our comfort zones. If we're perceived as being an ivory tower and talking to one another, and being proud of our discoveries and our awards and our accomplishments and the letters after our name, I think in the long run, the enterprise is gonna suffer in society's eyes and our potential for impact will diminish. The willingness of society to support us will decrease. Now, I have seen some professors who upon reaching retirement become embittered because their work was not fully recognized by the world. But I wonder what those professors had done to make the work known by the world. Did they write academic articles and academic journals and think they had contributed to public discourse? For the most part, neither the general public, nor lawmakers, nor business people read them. People will not search out our work in academic journals. We must bring it to the public. Other interests are beating us to the punch, publishing their own reports, often with a political agenda, and using social media to have far more impact on public opinion. Add to this changing landscape a rise in pseudoscientific journals, and we must face the reality that if we continue to write only for specialized scholarly journals, we become relegated further to the sidelines. As professors, we have an opportunity, indeed an obligation, to bring our work to the world. I once heard a propose that professors should, upon receiving promotion to full professor, be required to write a book that pulls together the 15 to 20 years of their research and aggregates it into a co cohesive whole, a book aimed at a lay audience. What an experience that would be. It would both terrify professors and change the view that they hold for their work and its purpose. The role of full professor is a rare and wonderful gift. Should we not use that gift to make a real and lasting difference in the world? Should we not learn new skills and models for how to play a new role and see our careers in the long arc that leads to that possibility? The seeds for that possibility must be planted early. You cannot shunt all interest and engagement aside for the 15 to 20 years it takes to get a PhD tenure and promotion to full professor, and then expect to suddenly reignite the passion. We must cultivate that passion while recognizing the expectations and demands of the institutions in which we live and work. Then when we are ready, 
We will have found a voice to contribute to society at a time when society most certainly needs us. Now, the more than ever, we need engaged scholars <clears throat> who can bring their expertise to the world, informing public and political discourse on the great challenges of our day. For this to happen, <clears throat> we need a more socially literate scientific community to engage a more scientifically literate public. We need scientists who can be effective communicators of what science does, how it does it, what it tells us, and what it means. We need scholars who can take complex issues and ideas and make them understandable to all demographics, young and old, poor and affluent, liberal and conservative. I hope this book stirs enough scholars to begin or to affirm their journey towards that goal and in so doing make a difference in the world. That's my intro, that's my preface. That's what the, the you can get a sense of the style of the book. It's made, meant to be easily read. Another theme on um, the, the Stanford briefs is no jargon, no charts, just make it, make it readable. And uh, this is my second book in this format and I, and I really like it. I think it really works well. So uh, that's my preface. My final point, I just wanna show you a slide deck of what's in the book, give you the argument. There'll be no surprise in the book. The book will expand those arguments, but let me open the slide deck. Andy. Yeah. Before you uh, start working through this, your slides, do you want to respond to some of the comments in the chat? Um, yeah, sure. Let's see. Uh, what for example, here. Anna Maria is saying, you know, uh, many faculty members have been doing community engagement for a long time and have been kind of punished by the rules of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Can I hold that? Because I'm going to talk about that. Um, um, maybe, maybe that question I can hold because it's in the deck. Okay. All right. I think it's a very important question. Are there others that maybe I should call specific attention to where I go? Sorry. Are there others that you want to call out, or should I just go through the deck? No, I think I think you yeah go to, go to the deck. Okay. Okay. And I really did not want to just be a talking head. So let me get through this and give you a sense of what I'm trying to do. Uh, the book has the preface, which you just heard, and has five chapters. Again, very short. It's um, very thin. I don't know if you can still see me, but it's very thin. <laughs> 133 pages. Um, the first chapter is called The Engaged Scholar. Someone said, what is an engaged scholar? And trying to define it, both what it is and um, why we need it. And this is the important question to my mind. There's a, a, a report by the, the RAND Corporation called Truth Decay, which I find really interesting. It's a really nice study. And think about the RAND Corporation. It's a, a Defense Department think tank. But they came up with four conclusions. Um, we're debating facts. We're blurring fact and opinion. We're distrusting previously trusted sources of information, otherwise known as the university, us. And we've never seen anything like this. And social media is a big driver of it. It's really creating confusion. Um, ask any doctor who talks to their patient and gives them their diagnosis and the patient comes back and says, well, I looked on WebMD or some other webpage, they recommend this. This is, this is the world we live in and we need to start to deal with it. And so this problem plays out, this, this chart in the middle from the Pew Research Center, this is US focus, but it does play out around the world of the difference between scientific opinion and public opinion on a whole host of issues. The National Geographic calls it the war on science. If you're not familiar with pseudoscientific journals or predatory journals, you better you should become educated. They're out there. Um, I recently got invited to give a submit a paper to a journal. I looked it up. It's been defined as predatory. What they do is they suck you in and then, then they make you pay. And there are journals out there. You can pay a price. You can publish anything. And two scholars tried to prove what a joke they were. And they actually published a paper. It's in the upper right. And excuse the language for one second, but the paper is called get me off your fucking mailing list. And this paper is that sentence over and over again. You can look this up and they published it. They merely paid a price and they published it. Now, obviously that's a joke, but trust me, there are a lot of papers that you can't tell it's a joke. They look really solid and they're not. And this is, this is the way that the scientific literacy of the public is being very confused. And it's done by deliberate attempt too. On the bottom right, that's a book. And I put that in very, very serious, sarcastic quotes. It's produced by a group called the NIPCC, not the IPCC, not the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Non-Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's produced by a group called the Heartland Institute, which is a libertarian climate skeptic think tank. And they produced this book trying to, to poke holes in the science of climate change. 
and they sent it to K through 12 science teachers around the world trying to change the curriculum in K through 12 science education. This is what we're up against. And so we need to step in. This is very, very important. There was a, 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 an article in 1963 in science that I came across one day called Chaos in the Brickyard. It's just one page. And it was written by a scholar from the Mayo Clinic. And I think it's, it has something to say to us today of the state of affairs of scientific research, of our distance from the real world issues of our day. He, he, the, the author drew an analogy. He said, imagine a, a world where you have brick makers and they make bricks and then the builder takes those bricks and build buildings. And when they need more bricks, they ask for more bricks. If they need a brick a certain shape, they ask for a brick that shape. And the bricks come in and we build buildings and we have a purpose to them. Imagine that world when things get out of whack and the brick makers start making more bricks than the builder needs and they start stacking up. And what happens if we live in a world where brick making becomes a, 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 an end unto itself? Now in 1963, he said, could that happen? I would argue in 2021, it has happened. We are producing a lot of bricks. We are brick makers. Um, I gave this one talk once and, and, and a professor said, uh, we're brick makers, not just with our papers, but also with our doctoral students. We just keep reproducing. And uh, I'll talk about it towards the end. I think that the, there's a new generation coming that's starting to push back. But are you a brick maker or are you doing something more? I offer that as a question. How serious is the problem that we face? Uh, I'm gonna give you two views. And the first you've already, I've already told you about, Jane Lemchenko says that science has a social contract with society to provide their work to the public. And there are many ways that we are blocked from doing that from paywalls to all sorts of things. And then this quote from Mark Schlissel saying, look, we, we do live a really nice life. And do we owe society more than just uh, padding our resume and getting a great job at a university like this? We owe society with our work. That's the light view of the urgency of it. There's a more serious view. The Economist had an article asking if higher ed is going the way of the big three, if they're ignoring the changes outside them and going to become damaged, if not irrelevant, by this. It's a fair question. And Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University, if you want to read about someone who's really trying to shake up higher ed, take a look at what Michael Crow is doing. But he had this to say. He said, we are increasingly filled with hubris, filled with arrogance, cut off from the general public and unable to find an appropriate tone with which to communicate. We need to communicate in ways that we've never even thought about communicating before because we don't figure out how to deal with this. The gap between the academic elite and everyone else will continue to grow. And what we now see as political discourse uh, will become people with pitchforks outside the door. They want to know what we're doing, why we exist, and why they're giving us money. This is a very, thing, very serious thing we need to focus on. Um, I think Michael Crow has a very serious point here. Um, if any of you saw it a number of years ago, there was a study that came out of Wharton. And part of it, they calculated the cost of an A-level management publication. And if you haven't seen it, get ready for a number that may surprise you. The number was $400,000 if you put in all the person hours and things that go with it. If the only purpose of that paper, of the only purpose of that $400,000 is a line on your resume to get a job at a great university, I think people do have a right to say, wait a minute, is that an appropriate use of resources? Is that what we should be doing? Especially at a time when tuition's going up and people are starting to question the value in many cases of higher ed. So I do think personally that we are facing a very serious issue. I spend some time in the book talking about a history of how we got here. And I think that anyone in the academic arena should understand how some of the institutions of our field got formed. And if you go back to World War II, you know, we, the World War II was won using science. And the president of the United States asked uh, Vannevar Bush, who was the, um, the president of MIT, to figure out how can we turn that scientific pursuit towards public benefit? And he produced this report, Science, the Endless Frontier. And that's really set some defining bounds on how we think about research today. That report made a clear separation between basic research and applied research and said basic research is what the government should fund, applied research, that all goes to industry. We don't touch that. And that really set a norm that stuck with us. And it really defines, even at the beginning of this talk, 
um, no offense, but it was framed as, well, we have academic and practice kind of focus. And we need to start to break down the division between those two. Donald Stokes has a book called Pastor's Quadrant. I mentioned it in the preface. And what he's trying to say is, wait a minute, this, this, this distinction is artificial. And we can think about blurring the two. He calls it use-inspired research. So consideration of use in a two-by-two two matrix, is it low or high? Question for, quest for fundamental understanding, is it low or high? Our target should be Pastor's Quadrant, use-inspired research. It has high value for the literature, it's high value for society. Can you think about your work in that way? And then what I'm trying to do here is it's less about the questions we ask and it's more about what do we do with the work once it's done? And that's where we get into the problems with the, the academic reward system. Uh, the reward system we have right now as one of the questioners asked is that you, you, you can have a cost to doing this. I think that's changing. I don't want to talk about this because what does the reward system tell us to do? To begin, uh, there are roughly 2 million research articles published each year in about 28,000 journals, those 2 million bricks. The average academic paper was cited only 10.8 times between 2000 and 2010. That drops to 4.67 for the uh, social sciences, according to Thomson Reuters. 82% of humanities articles were never cited, nor were 32% in the social sciences, 27% in the natural sciences, and 12% in medicine. And yet you can get tenure for this. Think about that for a second. Is that, what are we doing here? Is that really what this is all about? Getting tenure for journals that may not get read or cited? I ask that as a question. Now, why do we do this? Why are we pursuing this? Well, we have formal rewards and we have informal rewards. The formal rewards, are we have a, a, an A theory, uh, an A journal a theory fetish, what Dom Hambrick says. You know, you can have a paper that says wonderful things explaining the world around us, but where's the contribution of theory? Sorry, rejected. And that creates all kinds of weird phenomena. And you can have a hypothesis generating paper, but you can never test them because you're not contributing to theory. There are all kinds of problems with our central obsessive focus on A journals. That's the formal rewards. The informal rewards is something called the Carl Sagan effect. And Carl Sagan was a very famous um, uh, scientist who was denied tenure, um, was denied admission to the National Academy of Sciences. And a lot of his bio, and he was extremely influential and a lot of biographers, biographers feel that that was because he popularized science, he made it accessible. And people will look at you and say, well, if you do that, then you're not a serious scientist, you're not capable of doing the hard work, which is totally unfair and totally not true, but that bias does exist. When I was in graduate school, uh, the dean of uh, the business school where I was getting my PhD, Lester Thoreau, when he became dean, he was a very well-respected economist. When he started writing, when he became dean, he started writing uh, trade books. He wanted to bring his work into the general public. And the economists immediately started calling him less thorough. They started to mock him for doing this. Um, he took it well. But a number of years ago, he died, and the obituary in the New York Times still brought this up. I mean, for goodness sake, let it go. And I think that this can change, it will change. But there's a very interesting question around this because, you know, I'm on a committee at the University of Michigan to how to create the structures to, to, to further this. Mark Schlissel, this is very important to him. And he, uh, he the, the, of course, the committee said, well, we should have a, an award ceremony. And... Uh, and I was like, I, I really don't think that's a good idea. We did it anyway. And lo and behold, a lot of the senior professors were doing this. They chose not to come. They really didn't want to call attention to it. Um, so it's an interesting question on how we change it. But if we don't change it, these are some of the outcomes. First of all, A journals, they have a very limited audience. They have a very focused audience. They define and constrain what is considered research. Randy Sheckman, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, announced a number of years ago, he is no longer going to submit his work to what he calls the vanity journals of his field, Nature, Cell, and Science, because he says it distorts and constrains what's considered research because it has a very specific audience in mind. Interestingly, I um, got a chance to talk to Paul Krugman for preparing this book, and I said, you know, all your work for your Nobel Prize came out in B journals. Why'd you do that? He said, because the A's wouldn't take it. They didn't get, it wasn't within the bounds of what they considered legitimate research. So I had to go to the Bs and I hate that A, B hierarchy because I think of A's as much more theoretically driven, B's often more practically driven, different audiences and less creative and diverse research. And that's what the Randy Sheckman story comes in. 
guaranteed irrelevance. How long would it take? If you started a study today on COVID, collect the data, do your analysis, write the paper, submit it for review, go through what, two, three rounds of reviews, hopefully get accepted, gets rejected, you do it again. How long will that take for that paper to come out? Three, four years? Trust me, the conclusions aren't gonna be terribly useful by the time that happens. You can have papers come out much quicker in other types of journals. And so all I'm saying is being judicious and then questionable impact. That comes down to impact factors, that comes down to citation co- quotes, uh, uh, citation counts to really think through what are we doing? So there are the limitations of the academic reward system biasing us towards one kind of definition of scholar. The rules of engagement. Right off the bat, I want you to people to broaden their conception of the classroom. I have students who come, they pay tuition, they come into my classroom, and that's a certain mode and, and a certain form of engagement. But I also think of my classroom outside the, the, the university confines. I give talks to business audiences. I try and speak to, speak to the public. I think about that classroom as an extension of what I do. Now, it's important to recognize that classroom plays by a different set of rules than the academic seminar or the classroom at the university. And you need to understand that. First of all, it is messy. Um, You gotta be ready for some some pushback, some blowback. They don't play by any kinds of polite rules. And not all seminar rooms are polite, but uh, they they can be nasty. I I have a folder for hate mail. I I gotta put that right on the table to get you ready. there will, there will be blowback. Um, and when it first started happening, I, I really struggled with it. And then I started to realize that this was, this was inevitable and it's important. Um, someone gave me a quote. It's uh, attributed to uh, uh, Winston Churchill, but I can't verify that. Uh, and um, it says, if you're not offending anyone, you never took a stand. And I think that's really true. You give something in the general public, you write something for the general audiences and you get nothing back. Chances are you didn't say anything important. If you said something important, you will get blowback. That's just the way it goes. There's a quote from Paul Newman, and I have verified this. He says, if you don't have enemies, you don't have character. So have character. Say what your research tells you to say, and don't be afraid to put it out there. Uh, Another quote, uh, a friend of mine said this, and I, I can't find out where it came from. He says, you only get shot at when you're over the target. So if they shoot at you, you're saying something important. Now, In this chapter, I try and give you some summary of thinking about engagement, public engagement. The first is find your voice. Um, As you develop as a scholar, you start to develop a a vantage point, a viewpoint through which to to view the world. I'll never forget um, when I first got to meet Mayor Zald, who sadly passed away. I just loved listening to him speak. He saw the world through such a clarity and it was informed by his research, by his, 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 his theories, his literature, but he didn't use the jargon. He just understood the world in a certain way. As you develop as a scholar, that will happen to you. If you hear Jeffrey Sachs speak, he may not use the jargon of an economist, but you know he's an economist, that's his voice. And so find your voice and you'll start to feel it. You'll start to realize, you know, I see things in a certain way and I can give clarity on certain issues through that. Second, tell stories. Stories stick. Um, The book is sprinkled with stories. Uh, I'm on a committee with the National Academies of Sciences on the Science of Science Communication, our last conference. It was before COVID. A central theme was storytelling. How do you teach academics how to be storytellers? People remember stories. Even to the point, think about it, Alan Alda, an actor, funded a, a center for science communication at Stony Brook. Boston University hired an acting coach to come in and teach academics how to tell stories. People remember, I always open talks with a story. People remember those, so tell stories. Avoid the knowledge deficit model. And what this is, is you, the knowledge deficit model is that we academics, we have all this knowledge and we go out to the public and the public, their brains are half full. So we're gonna pour our knowledge into their heads. They're gonna think like us, they're gonna make smart decisions. A lot of academics approach the public with this mindset and it is perceived as arrogant. Um, When I hear an academic talk to a general public and say, you know, the literature says, it's a very off-putting statement. It's basically telling someone, don't challenge me because this is the literature. If you don't know the literature, who's gonna challenge you? And that is part of the knowledge deficit model. You need to engage. 
it has to be two way. You need to listen as much as speak. And that scares some academics. Um, I know firsthand here in Ann Arbor, there are some people that aren't connected with the university that are careful about inviting certain academics to dinner because they don't want to get lectured. We do that so often. And so avoid the knowledge deficit model, which means you need to know your audience. You need to engage with them. You need to listen. You need to go back and forth. Rely on solid research. There's a lot of good research being developed on the science of science communication. We just had a special issue of the proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences based on that conference. And there's a whole body of literature forming around this of how do you communicate? And then lastly, change your publication strategy. You may write that paper. It comes out in the journal. Rather than moving on to the next paper, can you summarize that for one of the many outlets that are available to, for you to write a short essay, put it out there, do a radio interview, on you go. Uh, maybe you write a paper and decide, you know what, it's not going to the A journal, it's going to B journals, or maybe it's going to a practitioner journal or one of the hybrid journals. Whatever it is, think differently about your publication strategy. Don't just be narrowly focused, A, 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 A. That's what I'm trying to think about in terms of the rules of engagement. There is a chapter entirely devoted to social media because this is changing our world and I don't think we are handling it as we should. I draw an analogy in the book um, between how academia is responding to social media and how the Catholic Church responded to the printing press. When Gutenberg developed the printing press, um, when Martin Luther King, or Martin Luther, sorry, Martin Luther started publishing pamphlets with opinions or perspectives on the Bible that diverged from that of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church tried to shut down the presses, uh, mocked the pamphlets as, as, as uh, uh, illegitimate, uh, really tried to resist the change that was happening uh, or ignore it. Uh, we in academia in many ways are doing the same thing around social media. Uh, these people are just stupid, you know, they can't, can't believe they believe that stuff we mock or we don't understand it. And let me give you an example. When I was a doctoral student, <clears throat> way back when, the way I did my research is I went up and I got found an article in the Social Sciences Citation Index. I went up into the stacks. I pulled out a book. I came down. I found the article. I Xeroxed it. I went through the bibliography, found another article back up to the stacks. It was very labor intensive, but it was a certain strategy, and that's how I found articles. Today, you just look in Google Scholar. Now, how many of you know how Google Scholar works? You don't because it's, it's proprietary. Their algorithms are proprietary. You don't know how it works. And that is a problem. We, how many of you would deny that Google Scholar is critical for your success? And yet, how do you know what pops up at the top of the list? Because if your paper, typically, if it doesn't show up on the first screen or worse, in the first three, no one's going to find it or very few people are gonna find it. So you need to understand how Google Scholar works because it's central to our field. You also need to understand how Scopus and Web of Science work. And they all use different algorithms. If you look up your H index in all three of these outlets, there's a good chance you're gonna get a different HX index for each one because they use a different algorithm. And so we need to understand social media. You need to understand DOI numbers and ORCID. You need to have an ORCID account. If you don't have one, get one understand how a DOI numbers works. That's how Google Scholar and Scopus with Web of Science will find your papers. If you write something that doesn't have a DOI number, you might want to talk to university about getting one assigned because these search web crawlers need to find it and DOI is a way to do it. There are these kinds of outlets for disseminating research and you have to decide how much energy you want to put into being a part of them, but they are becoming more and more important. And then Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, you may see them as irrelevant. I want to convince you they're not. There is a lot of research that's being done to show you, for example, that the more an article is tweeted, the more it's cited. A lot of scholars are using Twitter and Facebook for communication with other scholars, for finding papers. I think of my presence on Twitter as a curator. I don't tweet you know, Andy Hoffman and, uh, got up this morning and had a bowl of cereal. I don't tweet that I'm getting together with some friends. I tweet without commentary because there's a whole set of rules around Twitter. And I do offer some examples, some cautionary tales. Be careful what you tweet. It can come back and bite you. Don't offer commentary that can be incendiary. I see very little upside in that um, and a lot of downside. But I tweet articles and just the title. 
and then people pick it up. And, 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 and so I hope people see me as just a conduit, as a curator. There's a whole series of outlets available to you for publishing. You write your paper, and then you can write 500, 750 words and get it to a targeted audience, a corporate eco forum. Uh, the conversation is an outlet that I really like. There's, uh, they're in different countries. There's a conversation in the US, Canada, France, Australia. Uh, find one for you. There's the monkey cage in the Washington Post. Medium, a little less curated footnote. And I could fill this page. And I have a lot of scholars say to me, Andy, I don't have time to do that. And I just roll my eyes. You just spent what? Two, three years writing, getting a paper published, and you don't have an afternoon to summarize it in 700 words. The conversation, great format. And I'm not advertising the conversation, but I like what they're doing. Um, that you, you, you write your paper, they give you an editor, they edit it, they format it, they make it look pretty, they post it, it goes out under a Creative Commons license, anyone can repost it free of charge, and it gets out there. And I've done things in conversation that get me radio interviews and things like that, and people will read it. The newspapers, news media is searching for quality content because they're so damaged by the, 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 the lowering revenues in, in this business model. They want this stuff. And there's a lot of work being done on how to measure impact in social media, in public engagement. Altmetric has money from Smithsonian, Taylor and Francis. Impact Story has money from National Science Foundation. Plum Analytics is out there. They are trying to put numbers on impact that eventually, I believe, annual reports will have these alongside your H index or your citation counts or your A level publications. We live by numbers, sad but true. Numbers are being developed. So there's the fourth chapter. The fifth chapter, I really want you to think of the engagement and the arc of your career, wherever you are in the career, because you are gonna pop out at any one of these stages. And if you're like me, you didn't really think about what that stage meant until you became it. And I'd like you to start to think about it now. Assume you will get tenure, assume you'll become a full professor, assume you'll become an emeritus professor. How do you wanna play that game? Think also that in that course of that time, the institutions of our field are gonna change. So how can you sort of synchronize your career path with changes in the world? There's a, a hockey player from Canada named Wayne Gretzky, the great one. And he has a very famous and off-sighted quote. He says, you never go where the puck is, you go where the puck is gonna be. Where's the puck gonna be when you're full professor, when you're emeritus? Think about that because the world is changing. Right off the bat, there's a generational split. Uh, young people are coming in and starting to get more involved in public engagement. They really want to have that kind of impact with their work. And a lot of senior professors see no benefit from it, don't want to invest in the time in it. And I find this very interesting. It may surprise you, maybe not. But when I was a doctoral student, it was pretty much a norm that if, if a doctoral student announced their committee, at least at the school I was at, and a lot of schools I know this is true, if I announced, you know what, I don't think I want to go into academia, some of the committee members would have quit. And, and I've seen that happen even more recently, but it's much more rare um, because their, their job is to create more professors. Why would I invest time in you to do this? Now, they could do that then because very few people would step up and do that. More and more people are stepping up and doing that now. And if uh, academics quit those committees, we decimate the ranks of future professors to so strengthen numbers. And so there is a generational split, young people coming in and wanting to do it. And there's a lot of effort to try and push it. The National Science Foundation, I'm sorry, the National Academy of Sciences has the Sackler Colloquia, an unfortunate name, on the science of science communication. I've been involved in that. AAAS has the Center for Public Engagement with Science and Technology. Numerous universities <clears throat> are developing public engagement centers. And I, again, could fill the page with programs that are doing this. There's new kinds of efforts uh, here at the University of Michigan, a group of doctoral students and postdocs got together and said, well, if you're not gonna teach us how to do this, we're gonna teach ourselves. And they formed this thing called Relate. And they're saying, okay, we're gonna give seminars on how to talk to politicians, how to talk to journalists, uh, how to tell stories. And it's really great. Uh, the ASA, uh, American Sociological Association developed a report on how to uh, put public communication and, and promotion and tenure. Here at the Ross School where I teach, we've added a fourth criteria to the standard teaching, research, and service. And let's face it, it's research, teaching, and service. But we've added practice. Um, the ACSB <clears throat> is starting to rethink um, 
uh, how we uh, are accrediting business schools and trying to have more impact on there. The Mayo Clinic announced that they're going to include social media scholarship and academic advancement. And then, of course, we have the RRBM, us. And I think this is a very important movement to try and push academics forward to try and have a broader impact with their work. I can tell you this book is in part driven and motivated and supported by my I will statement that I made back how many years ago in Erasmus in, in Rotterdam. Um, and so I thank RRBM for pushing me along. So in conclusion, I wanna re reiterate this point that's in the preface. Not every academic must take on this role, but this book is a call to make that path more acceptable and legitimate for those who do, to enlarge the tent to be inclusive of multiple ways that one enacts the role of academic scholar in today's world. I wanna encourage all of you, as your career advances, experiment, think more about defining what it means to be a professor for yourself, or you will become somebody else. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Just wanna call out, there is a discount code of 20% at Stanford University Press, if you choose to use it. And with that, I will bring my slides to a close and open up to questions. Enough talking. Thank you, Andy. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll do what we usually do. You know, if you, we encourage you to, to post uh, your question directly by unmuting uh, yourself. And if possible, if you can also put your video on just to make it <clears throat> more personal, both for the speaker and for the audience. Um, feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom and um, myself or Andy will call you. Um, if you can't unmute yourself, you can also write your question in the in the chat function, which we will monitor. Um, whilst um, whilst I think the audience is recovering from your talk, Andy, perhaps I could kick off with the first question. Okay. Um, in in some of the previous webinars, you know, we, we talked about sort of theorizing and 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 sort of using practice, the the empirical data from observations from practice to theorize. But I suppose the part of the question is also how do we move the other way around, mm -hmm. right? So we, we can theorize, we can do research. Um, how do we take that into practice? How do we use the, those insights, those theoretical models, um, whatever else that we develop from through research into back into practice? Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I do, because I think that's a very important question because there are so many ways to do this. This comes into how you define and engage scholar for yourself. Uh, interestingly, I, I bring it up in the book. There was a survey of UK scholars on, um, on the, their work as scholars. And there was a series of questions on public engagement. And interestingly, a lot of scholars skipped that section. Uh, but many who did, when it got to questions of how to measure it, really came back and said, I'd really rather you didn't do this because I do this because it's important and I do it on my own terms. I do it in my way. And if you create metrics, people will chase the metrics and you're gonna kill the, the creative spirit of it. Uh, an analogy I like to think about here is that if you're a doctoral student, um, think about yourself as a musician, you need to learn your scales. But that doesn't mean you don't experiment. So if you're a doctoral student, do engagement, but recognize you need to learn the rigor of your field. But as you advance, as you start to master in the instrument, whatever it may be, you can start to become a jazz musician. You can start to add lib. you can start to improvise. And that's what I want people to do, I want people to improvise. So when I say public engagement, I should say publics, plural, because you may decide you want to engage in government or business or civil society or environmental groups, or the local community, or the local high schools. Um, there are many ways to do this, from giving government testimony, to speaking at business audiences, to doing work, consulting with companies. There are many, many ways to do this, and I want you to define it for yourself. Um, so that, that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. I think we have um, the first hand raised. Um, Serena, would you like to ask a question? 
Uh, sure. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, the uh, I want to go to kind of uh, earlier points that you were raising about doing practical research and its importance. And uh, for me personally, that's an issue that I have been dealing with since I started my academic career. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have an outlet. I'm I'm an assistant professor, just got my tenure, but it's um, it's pretty much impossible to publish your research, or at least as far as I know, to do the impactful research that you want to do to and um, to be recognized in our field. To to have there is no proper outlet to do that, and. Um, and unfortunately, like since I got started my PhD, we have had this discussion going on, but nothing happens. And and I wonder what your input is for someone in my career, my stage of career. So you're an assistant who just got tenure, so now you're associate. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. <clears throat> that, great. I mean, you now have uh, some degrees of freedom you didn't have just recently, and um, you know, it, it it's a funny thing we have. You know, you, you, I, I presume you do want to get full professor. So I understand there. But even when people get full professor, you know, they, they still conform to a certain mode. And, you know, I do my annual review and the most I can count on is maybe a 1.8% pay increase. That's the reward for walking the straight and narrow. Yeah. You know, it doesn't hold me in. I would challenge you to think differently about the idea that there's no outlets. Right off the bat, you could write a trade book. Um, there are you know, good presses, you know, Harvard Business School Press, Stanford University Press. The, the funny thing about this book is I was approached by Princeton University Press. So mm -hmm. I want something you read on, wrote on this. Would you, would you write a short, pithy book on this? I said, sure, I'll give them a proposal. They rejected it. I gave it to Stanford. They took it. So you do have book outlets to do this. And then also within, you know, I don't know your work, but there are audiences, I'm presuming, that would find your work interesting. Mm -hmm. Contact them. And sometimes it may require just knocking on a door and they will be, wow. You know, for example, here I, in Ann Arbor, uh, when I was heading an institute, we would bring in speakers and I contacted the local high schools. I said, you guys should, you know, send your high school kids. They, they were like, wow, no one's ever asked that before. Mm -hmm. um, I do reach out to business groups. Um, I have joined the board of the Corporate Eco Forum. Um, I've given talks at these groups. Once they see you, uh, the invitations will come in. Um, once you're seen as someone who's available, you're going to, as you start to become in demand, you're going to have to learn the word no, because you, you, it can really, if no one's doing it, you will become quite an interesting person. And, mm -hmm. um, I think about, for example, Gail Whiteman, um, I think she's at Lancaster these days, but she's also chief scientist for the world business council for sustainable development. How cool mm -hmm. is that? Mm -hmm. So as you, as you advance in your career, you can now start to improvise. Mm -hmm. and find ways. And um, uh, there, there have to be blog opportunities. And I personally think that universities should start to get more involved in producing video content for uh, continuing education for its alumni, for educating mm -hmm. the public. And I see some universities moving into that area, some with moderate production value, some with some really high production value. Maybe you talk to the university and say, you know, we have something to say that the public needs to hear. How can we create more ways for it to get out there? Um, the rewards, the formal rewards become less and less important as you advance in your career. Mm. And I would encourage you to take advantage of that, that latitude. Find others who feel the way you do, strengthen numbers, and together start to you know, crowdsource. Where are the opportunities mm. to do this? Um, um, I would, I would, I would challenge you the idea that there's absolutely no way to do this. Uh, so just, just to clarify, I uh, like translating your research. I can understand, and I, I do in fact like I started by publishing at Harvard Business Review because that's where the my audience are a large number of them. But the the actual research, if you want yeah. to, if you want to stay in the in the game, you have to basically butcher your the, the essence of your research. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, Andy Vandeman has a book called Engaged Scholarship. Mm -hmm. and, and I like the symmetry of those two titles because I think what Andy is doing is saying, how do you develop research programs that mm -hmm. are connected with practice? And I'm saying, <clears throat> once you're finished with the research, how do you bring it to the world? Mm -hmm. And so the, the two books go together. And okay. so he, I'm talking less about how do you change your research 
mm-hmm. approach to become more impactful. But isn't that what RRBM is all about? Is, is asking more questions of public relevance and put it in our top journals. Because oh. uh, I think the challenge before us is an institutional one. You know, one school could say, you know what, we're developing a new set of rules and, and you're gonna be rewarded for tenure for having more impact of practice. Mm-hmm. As a junior faculty member, you'd actually be unwise to totally follow that because unless you're guaranteed tenure, you need a packet that's saleable on the market. Mm-hmm. The market is not there yet. So we have to change everything in the market. You have to change the, the rules of promotion and tenure, accreditation, journals. We have to change the students. We have to change the donors, education. All these pieces have to change. And, and I do think if you think of Foster's S-curve, it's starting to turn. We're seeing all these innovations. Will it be stillborn and die? I hope not. Will it grow and then hit that steep part of the slope and really accelerate fast and level off to total penetration of the institutions? I hope so. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Anne. You're welcome. Thank you, Serena. Um, Berta, would you like to go next? Yes. Hello. Hello, Andrew. Thank you very, very much for your talk and your book. Um, oh, I see I myself the piano behind you. Will you will you play for us? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not playing. I'm I'm just sharing my nephew's uh, <laughs> place for for a while. Um, so that's his piano. And it's not mine, oh. but uh, I used to play long ago. I just you know it's part of all this publish or perish business that kills you <laughs> artistic and other creative abilities. Um, I just want to say thank you very much. I think uh, the time has come for what you were talking about, and it's not that it's New. it's always been there but not valued mm-hmm. and I think we're in a time of great transition and um, and we're looking for new solutions and uh, to very complex problems that are persisting you know and becoming even you know more complex um, I just wanted to point out something I came to academia after s- several years working in international peace building conflict resolution work with a nonprofit and when I came back to academia I found that the academia was, um, ten for me, ten years behind. Hmm. Uh, uh, it's like I slowed down. I was forced to slow down, uh, and then take on a new way of practicing. Um, and and very, for so for the past several years, I've been quite frustrated mm-hmm. with the publish and perish. I have not gone into a situation where I am in a tenured position. So perhaps that has worked out to my advantage rather than disadvantage because it has caused me to ask what is the relevance of my love for being in academia and also my love for engagement in the community because I was so engaged. I learned a lot in my seven years work experience. It was in between academic uh, experience. So um, I think for me, what I'm learning now and maybe to just share with everybody else is uh, to unlearn some of the practices in academia that stop you from uh, engaging the community. And this is really a moment for being creative and seeing how we can open that space. It's not a, a, a time for asking the university to do it for us because I've been part of a lot of initiatives to get the university to do it for us. And to me, it's not going far. We just need to build a critical mass to open that space and to show the value of it powerfully. Um, so uh, that's where I'm, I'm an assistant professor right now, but in a where I'm, I'm also thinking through where I want to go next and leaving my current position to just think creatively for my next position. I want to get engaged. I want to do the work that straddles both uh, the theory and practice because I got a sense of it in my previous work experience where we were thinking activists. We were in the field, working with communities, solving very complex problems Mm -hmm. uh, that also had theoretical impact, uh, but also had policy impact. Um, I want to recapture that and, and, and update it for today. So I just want to thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your book. I've purchased it and I'm waiting for it. <laughs> I'm in Michigan right now and hope I can reach out to you. Uh, oh, of course. In a few weeks. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you say something interesting and maybe my, my perspectives on this are motivated by a similar experience. I didn't start my PhD until I was 29. Yes. So I had a lot of work experience and so I came yes. into it and it was very difficult. It was very difficult to start yes. to theorize. But it, it is, you know, it is hard work, but you got to do it. Um, yes. It's learning the scales. Yes. Or I, I uh, use an analogy in the book that I think of my academic writing as cod liver oil. 
I take cod liver oil, it tastes awful, but it makes me healthy. Yes. I do the academic papers, I find them very difficult, but they help me to be academically healthy and have impact. Yes. Um, there, there's something you said though that I wanna, I wanna pick up on. You talked, you use the word activist. And this is a this is this is a tricky territory because I think about it like a supply chain. Mm -hmm. People do the you know the theoretical work. I stand on their shoulders. I bring it down to a point where I want to have work that has empirical relevance. You want to be careful though, because once right. you step over a line to become an activist, you lose the stature of the university of being an objective researcher. Okay. Once you've lost that, it's hard to get it back. Now, maybe you're fine with that, then maybe you want to be in an activist group or, or a think tank. I mean, you could be at Resources for the Future or Brookings and, and really have a hard stand, a point of view. But if you are a university professor and you're seen as an activist, that can be problematic, both in terms of uh, how are you, you are viewed outside the university and also how you, what, what people think of you when you come up for tenure. Mm. So, so, yeah, that's a tough one. And maybe you could speak more to that because a lot of the work, especially for those of us, I come from Kenya originally, and many of us in the global south, a lot of our work is not just, at least for me, my work was in many African countries. And I found myself lobbying and advocating for change in from donor international donor policies yeah. to even government policies and even the creation are contributing yeah. to processes of creating new policies that are relevant for the context. So. I was just wondering, maybe to speak more to that, because it puts line, us in 10 years the, uh, ground. The line between knowledge source and activist is very blurry. Yeah. And so you can give government testimony and say, I think we should have a carbon price. Yeah. Or you can go out in front of the state house with a sign and pick it and scream. I would advise you not to do the latter. So yeah. stay at some degree. It doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. I mean, I think this idea of objectivity has gone too far that we stop being human. But be careful on, on, you know, you can ally. For example, I think of the Union of Concerned Scientists as a group that I could take my work, I could take it only so far, I throw it over to them. And they'll take it, they'll take it in the activist domain or, or others will do that. Or the Citizens Climate Lobby or others. I'll speak to groups like that. I've even speaking, spoken to uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, uh, I have a friend who went on the Bill Maher show. I mean. You know, there it, it's a blurry line. It's an interesting one. We're still playing it out, but but be aware of the dangers of going yeah, through. I, I, I take that, but I just want to add that there's opportunities for yeah. us to also create uh, uh, like policies, helping processes for creating policies, uh, yeah. and 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 letting people see what what is possible. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, terms. government testimony is well within our domain. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Dekha, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was a very engaging talk. Um, Andrew, uh, my question is... No pun intended. <laughs> no, I am absolutely serious. Mike Barnett, who's a friend of mine, he, he joked that when you're done with the engaged scholar, then you can do the married scholar and then the divorced scholar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, my question is this, that... Um, in, in the two years that I've been doing my PhD, there has been in a lot of discourse about doing impactful research and you know working on something that can actually move the needle, flow against the tide, make people think in a different way. So, so much has been said about it. And I think me and a lot of scholars in this forum are totally invested in this idea. Uh, but uh, you know, my apprehension or worry is that we have a whole lot of scholars who are invested in this very wonderful idea. But then when we get tenure and when we start working, we work in a system which expects us to work in the same old way of, you know, uh, publish or perish. So that would be an extremely mentally traumatic experience for a lot of us. So my question is this, that is there enough demand for this supply of scholars who are invested in this idea? Uh, or are we doing this in supposition that this demand will come one day, which is good, but is it fair to suppose so? Yeah. Well, I would begin by saying, I would encourage you not to search for a topic that is impactful, externally defined. I would encourage you to find a topic that you are passionate about, 
I'd like you to think of your career as a calling or a vocation that gives you meaning and purpose uh, because that's what's gonna keep you focused over the long arc of your career. I started an environment, I'm still an environment. Concepts of the environment have changed. Climate change wasn't really an issue when I started, now it is, which is a totally different kind of problem. And that will get you out of bed when the headwinds are strong. I can tell you when Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord, it was really hard for me to just, why am I doing this? One person can undo so much, do so much damage. But if it's, if it's what you care about, you will be curious. You will be constantly driving curiosity. The curiosity is so important. And so is there demand? I mean, if you are doing work that you think is important, that is relevant, I think you will be able to communicate to others its importance and its relevance. And so I, I don't really see it as a demand issue. I mean, at the end of the day, I could have just written academic papers on the environment and never brought it to the general public. Um, I did benefit. The environment is a topic that the general public cares about. And so it wasn't that hard for me to find uh, other outlets. I used to joke that I could publish my papers twice. You write your academic paper, and then you totally rewrite it for like Sloan Management Review or California Management Review or Social, Stanford Social Innovation Review. And I, and I mean that sincerely, you have to rewrite it and it's a different kind of language. You have to be multilingual. And I could never do two on the same day. I could never do an academic paper and a practitioner paper. My brain was just wired once I started one. And so uh, I would encourage you not to think about it in terms of what's the topic that's gonna have impact and think about it instead. What's the topic that I'm still gonna be working on? I wanna work on 10, 15, 20 years from now. You don't have to stick to it. You can change your direction. I've seen many people do it. Your passions can change, your purpose, your vocation can change. But you know, that is the beauty of the academic pursuit is we, we get to wake up in the morning and decide what we wanna work on. Now, you do have to publish and, and that is the hard work. That's the cod liver oil, you gotta do it. Um, but then as you advance, you can start to speak to other audiences through other outlets and other means on the work that you care about. Um, you know, you can, if you're passionate about it, you can convey that passion. Trust me, you can. And so I'd encourage you to think about it that way. Could I, this is uh, Carrie Leanna at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, I'm also, I guess, somewhat of a senior scholar and uh, hi, Andy. Uh, I, I just wanted to affirm a couple of things you said. And one, I, I also chaired our promotion and tenure committee for the school for the past couple of years. Uh, one thing that you said about um, uh, that you have to learn your scales uh, first. And so I think that focus early in your career without losing your passion is really important. And one of the ways that I try to do that is exactly what you just said, Andy, that I always write once I published in the Academy of Management Review, or Organizational Science, whatever the standard academic journal is, try to write a translation piece of that work to reach a broader audience or just volunteer to speak to uh, practitioners that would be interested in this. That so, I, I mean, I think you can do both. It, you know, it's, it requires more work and you're not going to get conventionally rewarded for the latter uh, in terms of, you know, that piece in Stanford Social Innovation Review or speaking to school superintendents or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, but you're doing that for yourself in, in some ways. And I think slowly the institution changes. One thing I'd like you to address, Andy, but I don't want to get out of turn here, but maybe before you hang up, um, is about changing institutions. Um, do you want to take that question on changing institutions? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, th this is a, this is, boy, that's a challenging question. Um, I did a, a conference here at Michigan in 2015. It's called a Michigan meeting. And I was given a, a nice piece of funding to do a conference. And, and um, that's when I really learned that this is an issue that, that, that is, his time has come. And one way I learned that is my opening panel, I was able to get four university presidents to sit on the stage at the same time. Try getting one university president to come to your conference. I got four, um, it just blew my mind. And 
they really cared about it. Now, something interesting happened in that meeting. And the questions from the audience really shifted towards, you're the president, fix it. And they handled it politely. But then when the session was ended, we went to another room. It was just me, the four of them, and a photographer to take pictures. And the moment that door closed, they lit up. They said, who do those people think we are? Do they think we just have a magic wand and we can make professors do whatever we want them to do? We don't. Ask any dean. And so institutional change is hard. And it, it requires uh, someone stepping out of line, uh, someone innovating. And there are a lot of forces to stop us from doing that. I think the rankings are one of the more pernicious ones. If you deviate too much from the rankings, the dean is going to get hammered and the dean is going to be hesitant to do that. But also there are ways to start to shift it. And it's interesting, I devoted a lot of effort and energy to try and change the institutions directly. When I set up that meeting, uh, it had to get approved by all the deans. And one of the deans said something very interesting and I never forgot it. It's still on my radar when the time is right. And maybe Carrie, you have thoughts on how to do this. She said, if you could do this conference and produce two reports, one for the professor, how do you work this into your career? And that's to some extent this book. Two, administrators, how do you create an environment that's more conducive and supportive to this kind of activity? And I think that we're starting to see innovations in that line. Uh, you brought up promotion and tenure. There are some schools now that allow the, the candidate to write a practice statement, an impact statement. Some schools are allowing you to get letters from practitioners. Uh, it's key that that committee have someone on there that understands the value of what that person's writing, because if the committee is made up of professors who know nothing about the A-level publication mantra, they're not going to see the value in it. Maybe get the metrics from Altmetric or, or Plumex or whatever onto there. So we're starting to see some innovations. But I also learned that I think the biggest impact I'm having is by modeling this path visibly and that people are seeing going, oh, maybe you can do this without totally destroying your career. Uh, maybe that's my contribution to starting to shift the institutions and giving hope and support to others who want to do this. I don't know. But Carrie, everyone, you know, to change institutions, you know, you have different pieces of it. You have to focus your attention on the ones available to you. And then um, if you're in positions of power within them, maybe you can start as we as senior scholars, I think have an obligation to manage the institutions of our field. I don't think enough of us do this. We just accept them as they are and, and continue to live by them. And uh, we as senior scholars should speak out and try and change the institutions to make an environment that's more conducive for those following behind us. I, I love Deb Meyerson's idea on the idea of a tempered radical. Um, I like to think of myself as a tempered radical. I'm, I've succeeded by the rules of the game, but I think differently and want to change the rules now that I have some position from which to do it. And so I would encourage all senior professors to take that on. Thank you, Andy. I think Thomas has been patiently um, mm -hmm. holding his hand up. <laughs> I hope your arm's not sore. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. That's the beauty of Zoom. Uh, thank you very much for the conference. It's really nice to see so many people from all around the world. And hello, everyone. Uh, I have two questions. So one of them, I put them in the chat already. It's a where, I mean, publish or perish. It must have solved some issue when it wasn't put in place, right? So what problem did it solve? Where did it come from? Because if we want to, I guess, if we want to replace it, we need to understand why it was there in the first place, right? Yeah. Yeah. And second, um, what happened if you if you refuse to play that game? Basically, you get fired from university, or you never become tenured. And if you don't become tenured, it's just you have less money. I mean, uh, what is the what is the downside if you prefer not to play? Thank Two you. very good questions. Uh, in the first chapter, I don't speak specifically to the idea of where the public publish or perish come from, but um, I do talk about, the, the, there's a wonderful book by Rakesh Karana called From Higher Aims to Hired Hands. And he describes the evolution of the, the business school model. And you had business schools forming and universities said, this isn't an academic pursuit. Sorry, we don't want to hear. And they said, no, 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 no. We're, we're not gonna just teach skills. We're gonna teach the titans of industry on serving society through commerce. We're gonna teach in a model similar to, for example, doctors and lawyers. Oh, okay, you can do that. Uh, 
his conclusion in the book is that through a process of about 100 years, we've totally reneged on that deal. And we're, we're, we're just teaching, we're skill shops. In the interim, something very interesting happened. There was a study done, oh boy, I apologize. I think it's the Ford Foundation that did this. I think it's Ford, I may be wrong. Uh, Ibrat, you're, you're shaking your head yes. It was Ford Foundation. They did a study and they said, look, all this stuff coming out of business schools, there's no rigor to it. There's nothing there. And so that's when you start to see things like administrative science quarterly formed and, and the idea of creating a rigorous research domain. And they borrowed from psychology and sociology. And so suddenly we became very theoretically focused. In my opinion, the pendulum swung too far and we have to swing it back and get some more balance. And so this idea of publish or perish, it's, it, it's pervasive within the university and business schools adopted it as a way to be seen as legitimate within the rest of the university because at the end of the day, we are scholars. We're supposed to produce knowledge. How do we measure the knowledge? Papers. I think that's a very flawed metric. Um, uh, there's a wonderful article. I've always enjoyed it by Paul DiMaggio many, many years ago saying what theory is, what theory is not. And he just laughs. He said, this, is, this whole thing is totally silly. You know, my paper on the iron cage gets cited basically, wow, isn't it weird? Act, organizations do all kinds of wacky things. They're totally irrational. Even, even though you even have rationality in the title of the paper, totally became a ritual site. And, uh, and what does it measure? What does it tell us? I'm not so sure. So, so we do need to have some kind of metrics to justify our existence. We love numbers. Papers is one number. Citation counts is another number. We need to balance that with other numbers, other, no, other measures of impact in different communities. And that's, that's the key. Now, if you refuse to play the game, um, I would like to rephrase that. If you play the game that is most important to you, then there is a possibility you will not get tenure and you will be asked to leave. I would ask, is that so bad? Because maybe it's better to not be in academia and be in a think tank or be in a nonprofit or a government research group or a business research group. There are many places where the kind of thinking you're trained to do as a PhD can be applied. And that would be, it would be better to find a place that fits with what you want to do than distort and contort yourself to fit into some kind of model that you just don't want to be. I, to my mind, that's a recipe for unhappiness. Now, that's not to say some contortion is not necessary. I mean, I mean again, uh, academic papers are hard and the language is turgid and it's, and it, 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 it's just, it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, you got to do some of it and it's cod liver oil and it tastes bad. You got to do it. Can you do enough of it? And then still keep your identity. That's the key. But if you totally change who you are and what you want to do in this world, you get one life. Don't become something you're not. And there's, there's my, my response to if you don't play the game. Okay. Thank you. Um, Vicky. Would you like to go next? Um, something wrong with your sound, Nikki. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, no, my headphones don't work properly for some reason with Zoom. Okay. Anyway, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm Vicky Ward. I'm a reader, so I guess uh, um, an associate, um, yeah, associate prof uh, at the University of St Andrews in Scotland. Um, my research is in the area of knowledge mobilization, knowledge use, research use, all of that stuff as an area of academic study. And um, one of the things that really struck me when you were introducing your work and you were introducing the book was that you talked quite a lot about, um, you, you mentioned words like solutions and answers and, and things like that quite often. And one of the things that I think that is very difficult for researchers, myself included, is feeling that we actually have any answers and we have anything to offer because a fundamental part of the academic pathway is realizing that you know very little about anything really. Um, and so I, I've come to the conclusion over the last years where I've been thinking about this um, space, but really, I think that my role as an academic is much more about helping people to 
think rather than telling them what to do. And I think it sort of gets to something that Bertha was mentioning earlier as well. So I, when she said about being an activist, I didn't hear the word activist in quite the same way, I think, as perhaps you heard it. I heard the word thinking activist. And actually, I think that we should be activists for thinking, for thinking about things and for engaging in things. So I tend to think about it in helping people think in a different way rather than providing those kinds of, of answers. Um, so I, I think that I, I just wondered if you had any reflections around that. I do. Um, and I also just wanted to give a bit of a UK perspective as well about the idea of um, tenure and whatever, because um, you've obviously presented a very... Um, such a focus on what's happening in the States. Um, but in the UK, there are a number of different universities around the UK that do include knowledge exchange and impact as part of their um, promotion procedure. Mm -hmm. So, And it can be a really, really big part of promotion. Obviously, we have the research excellence framework. I'm really sorry I mentioned it, everyone. Um, but an impact is a really big part of that as well. And you can't have impact without engagement. So it is a part of the landscape, I think, here in the UK. So perhaps we do have some good opportunities. So if, if there are kind of PhD students on the call who are in the UK, um, there are things are moving apace um, around impact and engagement. So we do have hope, I guess. Well, absolutely. I mean, I know in the UK, the government is now requiring universities to create impact statements to receive funding. And that's, you know, to Carrie's question, one piece of institutional change. You know, certainly the, the powers that be can drive change. You know, the idea of solutions or answers is, is a really good question um, because I don't want to advocate that we come in, here's the answer from on high. I am a professor, listen to me. And that speaks to the idea of the, the, the problem of the knowledge deficit model. Here in Ann Arbor, we have a city near us, Detroit, that has been working hard to come out of a very deep depression. And uh, they, the people in Detroit resent when scholars from the University of Michigan drive over, give the answers, drive back. No, it doesn't work that way. The only way you're gonna be able to have impact in Detroit is to start to form relationships to start to co-create knowledge in the sense that you know your problems better than I do. You know what works better than I do. Um, I use the example in the book that, you know, my father-in-law is a farmer and he's been farming these fields for 50 years. And an agronomist can come in and say, you know what, this is how you farm this field. And my father-in-law would have every right to say, I, I, think I, I think I know a thing or two about this field. And thank you for the, that guidance, but those are not all the answers. And so understanding the potential and the limits, Roger Pielka Jr. has written a lot about this, that we need to understand what we can do and what we can't do. I also think that a lot of our research, we are afraid to come to conclusions, especially forward-looking conclusions. A lot of our research is backwards looking, but I do think, and you hit on something, a lot of people don't know how the scientific method works. They don't know what it does. They don't know how it reaches conclusions. And so I think that engagement can begin by saying, okay, this is, this is the work that's being done. This is how they come to their conclusions. These are the conclusions that, and what do they mean for you? And that is a much broader conversation than for example, the seminar room where we come in and say, here's my hypothesis, here's how I tested it, here's the conclusions, go forth and be informed. And, and again, People resent the knowledge deficit model. They resent being talked at. They resent being just told what to do. And that is a cautionary tale around COVID, around climate change, where people come back and say, oh, if you don't want to get vaccinated, you must be stupid. You don't believe in climate change, you must be you know, crazy. That, that is not helpful. Um, there are legitimate reasons why some people are afraid of vaccines. I mean, Jenny McCarthy, uh, a big person in the anti-vax movement was offended when doctors came in with this very arrogant attitude and just started putting chemicals in her baby's body before they even talked to her. And she has a right to say, wait a minute, time out. And so there is a basis there. There is a legitimacy for their concerns and their fears. And so 
that requires a degree of empathy, a degree of humility, which I think many academics could get a better handle on. So I, I resonate with your comments entirely and I thank you for bringing them up. Thank you, Ricky. Um, Sergey. Yeah, thank you very much, Brad. Um, and you, you know, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to, to, the, to the idea of impact. And uh, we have to say that the problem is in the, in the management field. So we don't have that problem in the STEM, uh, STEM research. All right, so those, those guys do, uh, do something relevant for the industry and uh, it, is, it is in, in the hand. Um, as I said, I'm sympathetic. So from time to time, I express those ideas and, I, and people say to me, Sergey, so what to do? So uh, I want to ask you what to do. So uh, if we talk about promotion and tenure, it is less dramatic, but for the entry level, Right, so it is impossible to get a job without a, a, a paper in three, four star journals, you know, a decent job. All right, so in, in this situation, you know, any, anything goes, all right. So, and in this situation, I mean, uh, I don't care whether it's gonna be an impact, impactful research or it's gonna be just a paper published, all right. So my message is that we play games but we start playing those games at the beginning when we need any article and then those games became dangerous all right so and as soon as you have committed your efforts as soon as you've published two three uh, papers it's really difficult for you to, re to reverse right so my message is if not publications what can we use as a proxy for a professional fitness for teaching for example right so people apply for jobs all right, so, and uh, arguably anyone can teach, All right? So some people can teach uh, better, some people can teach um, uh, less good, right? But if you put in front of the class, a uh, seasoned veteran in business, right? Who spent 20 years in industry on high uh, level positions, instantly that person gonna be reduced to a lecturer in the eyes of students. If you put uh, someone who never spent uh, a single day in business, instantly that person gonna be expanded to a not knowledgeable person. So if not, if we are not using publications, the track record. So what can we use as, as a proxy for, for, the, for the professional fitness for this job? Well, let me make clear from the beginning, I am not suggesting we eliminate academic publications. Um, I am not. Um, we need to, develop a rigorous knowledge and the journals are a way to test that rigor. What I'm arguing is that what do you do with it once it's done? Because you write that academic paper. Um, trust me, no one in business has heard of much less read ASQ, Org Science, AMJ, AMR. They don't. And so how, what I'm trying to say is once you write it, how do you bring it out of there? Um, there's something I wrote way back when I was really early in my career. And I said that theory without relevance, um, theory, rel wait, relevance without theory is editorial. Relevance, uh, theory without relevance is impotent. Um, and so I do feel that we, we produce a lot of work that, that needs to get out there, can get out there. And I do believe that your research will be better it's a scary thing to take your research out to inform people about the world they're living in, to give a presentation to a business audience and they are actually doing it. And you're gonna come out and say, okay, this is how the world works. And they, they're gonna come back and they may resist. They may resist, you know, screw you, what do you know? And, and, and I've had that kind of pushback, but then you can have a discussion. You're gonna have a dialogue going back to, to Vicky's comment. This is, how, this is how these conclusions were developed. and. And, you know, I, I had a friend, Mike Tushman, one time said to me, Andy, one of the reasons a lot of academic, business academics don't go into the business world to give their research is they're afraid to be told they're wrong. Um, but being told you're wrong, being tested, you're gonna develop better research questions as you move forward. But again, two things that I wanna really reiterate and, and hit stronger if they didn't come out clear. Impact is not just it's, it, it's in the title of the book, but 
I also, it has, to, it has to have a modifier. You can have impact in academia, in the academic literature. You can have impact in your community. You can have impact in the business world. And every, this, this book, I tried to write it discipline agnostic. I tried to write it in a way that could be used by many different disciplines. Um, but every discipline has a different posture towards this question. Um, some disciplines, of course, that's what we do. I mean, um, uh, economics, much more comfortable with public engagement, public policy as well. Uh, engineering to some degree, but they're still about producing work, but then sometimes they'll develop businesses on the engineering campus. Some dis disciplines, sociology, psychology, history, less so, and they define it for themselves. So at Ross, we have that fourth category is delivery called practice, because you want to have impact in practice. How do you do that? Who are they? Well, it's business people. It could be government as long as it's government related to business. It could be nonprofits as long as they're impacting the market. We define that community of who we want to have impact on. And going back to your original point, I am in no way advocating eliminating academic papers or academic publications. I want to augment it. I want to expand it. That narrow focus by itself, I think, limits the value of what we do, the relevance of what we do. And it's coming back and hurting us because people are questioning what we're doing. And, and society is being hurt by this because, you know, there are reports coming out with a very clear political angle in this period, this strange world we're living in right now, of fake news and alternative facts. We need to come in and say, this is how the scientific method works. This is how it develops, the answers it develops. These are what those answers are. To Vicky's point, and or you can, you know, this is the result of their work. And here are the limitations. You know, Roger Pilpa's book, The Honest Broker, caused quite a stir. He he talked about the role of the academic and policy discourse. He laid out four different models for doing this. There are two that are really important. One he called the issue advocate, and one he called the honest broker. The issue advocate takes all the scientific knowledge, it narrows it down and says, this is what the public needs to know. The honest broker says, here's all the information. The public will figure it out. Now, he tried to say he wasn't making a pejorative statement, but he did call it the honest broker. And a lot of scientists looked and said, you're calling us issue advocates. And the, the public can't consume all the information that's out there. What are you trying to say? But he's making a very important point because the moment academic scholars narrow what's available to the public, they're perceived as hiding something and their level of trust goes down. And this is a difficult, to, this is, you know, again, going back to Vicky's comments, we put our knowledge out there, but recognize that there are also other issues at play in political responses like COVID. Scientists would probably like us all to move into a closet for a year and not go near anybody else and contain this virus. Obviously that's not uh, economically, politically, socially feasible. We have to accept some degree of risk if we're gonna still to live like human beings and scientists, uh, you know, the conclusion has to be put into the public domain, but then the conclusions of the political process, we don't have the final say and accept that. Does that answer your question? To great degree. Thank you very much, Andy. When you when you unmute Ibrad, I get some weird echo. 
And we can't hear you. Is your goal to bring this to a close with no more questions? Maybe I just asked one question. I had a question and I don't know what okay. I was trying to do. So we keep going. Yeah. Okay. Go uh, greetings from Helsinki. Uh, I have a question which is quite related to a lot of things that have been said so far, but maybe like taking it to a bit further level. And it's the following. So I understand your book and the, what you presented today about to be mainly directed to the individual, like as a scholar, this is what you can do, there are these opportunities and so on. But apparently, and in particular as a younger, non tenured track scholar, like we are confined by pressures, we need to do certain things, we need to get our next jobs, our next funding and stuff like that. So I was wondering whether from the work you're doing, whether you are also trying to draw out recommendations for, for instance, the field of business management organization studies to actually provide that air for scholars to be engaged. What do you mean by the air? Well, well space, air, in terms of like that we do not get confined in our careers by how much we published in numbers, in what journals we publish, the age index, how many citations we get. Like, is there a point of redefining for the 21st century yeah. what is relevant, what is important, and what is perhaps impactful research? I, you know, I think you are describing what I would like to see happen, redefine impact within the academy. And... Um, um, bringing in new kinds of metrics, allowing different kinds of considerations in the promotion and tenure process, different forms of training. I mean, one of the challenges here is that many senior professors don't know how to do what I'm describing. How are the junior professors gonna learn? Well, we need to develop content. Um, and if you can't find it at your school, develop it yourself and find it elsewhere. I learned a lot of this. I was fortunate enough to go through something called the Leopold Leadership Fellowship Program which taught us things like social media. And I was resistant at first, Twitter, I'm not gonna do that, that's, 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 that's toxic land. Or they dropped us in, in, in the federal government and said, okay, you know, go find some lobbyists, go find some politicians, talk to them. They're gonna teach us how to do government testimony in the chamber. I mean, I was trained to do this. If you're not trained to do this, find a way to get the training. And there are programs out there to help you do this and, and develop the skills. And then, you know, how do we change the institutions? How do we change promotion and tenure? There's, that's the, that's the brass ring, that's the challenge. And so you have to live within the world as it is, but also try and recognize and drive change to make it what it should be. I find it bizarrely ironic that as a business school professor, if I write something that's aimed at my students or the profession, it doesn't matter. I find that strange. I serve on committees for the National Academy of Sciences. That doesn't really register either. The proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences is not in a journal in my school. I find that bizarre. And I think most right thinking people would find that bizarre as well. In some ways, I feel like I'm saying the emperor has no clothes. And um, so hopefully things will change, but with a serious dose of sober reality that you still have to play the game by the rules as they are, but try and work this in and get the training you want if this is the kind of professor you want to be and don't just conform to what the rules want you to be. I hope that's helpful. I am trying to instill hope, inspire, which is something again that academics are not typically geared to doing. Um, I think that, that hope accomplish far more than optimism. Than uh, if I may allow uh, myself one more comment here, just, um, I know you wrote on institutional theory, you use it quite a lot, and I'm also quite fond of it. I found a lot in this theory for me, but it's interesting that when it comes to our own field, it's like very difficult to articulate what are institutions and how do we change them? Like we don't know, right? 
I wrote a paper way back in 2004 on this topic for strategic organization. And I wanted to point out the weird ironies of our field. And so I, I'm not gonna make fun of somebody else. I'm gonna make fun of myself. I write papers on change within institutional fields that don't change. I write on whether individual actors have agency within institutional fields. I write that as a theoretical question. Then when I'm finished with my paper, I go down in the classroom and I teach management. I effectively teach people how to be agents within institutional fields, totally ignoring the disconnect between the topical theoretical question and the practical realities of what I'm doing in the classroom. And I, I find that uh, institutional theory also can be very opaque, very, very difficult to understand, very difficult to translate, and can get hung up on very minor points, very, very, some of my peers are gonna get pissed off at me for saying this, but you know, the debate of whether it's a logic or an institutional or value, I mean, these are very subtle points that at the end of the day, if you're communicating with the general public, um, I, just had, I just had a paper, it's gonna come out in um, behavioral science and policy. And they edit these papers to make them accessible. And I'm embarrassed to say, they said your paper was one of the hardest ones we've ever had to translate because it was very, it, it, the, the jargon slips in, it's institutional theory. And I, I was embarrassed by that. And, and that, that, that's unfortunate because I think if you can't, if you can't translate your work for a regular audience, your mother or your father, um, do you really understand it? Is a fair question. And will you understand it better by putting it into common language? I think you will. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, JP. Um, can you hear me now? This is much better. All right. Yeah, I think that maybe Zoom on my laptop is playing up. Um, yeah, Molly has a question, I know. Um, Molly, would you like to unmute yourself? Maybe she has the same problem as me. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, any other questions in the audience before we wrap up? Yeah, so Natalia here from the Netherlands slash Switzerland, it's a, it's a Hebrew situation. Um, I would just like to comment from like looking from, from, you know, how difficult academic institutions are to change, especially when it comes to um, uh, embracing the importance of relevance and, and having a wider impact beyond academia. I do have to say two things. First of all, business schools have proven to be very, very resistant, you know, as, as many colleagues have already mentioned, there are pushes, many pushes from, from the national research uh, assessment agendas, be it REF in, in UK, be it in the Netherlands, be it in Hong Kong, Australia, many uh, research assessment agencies, national research assessment agencies are pushing for more relevance and, and impact. And business schools are very reluctant to adapt because they would have to change the way they award uh, um, their faculty members. And, and what I've observed, you know, I, I used to work at RSM, very research intensive business school. Now I'm at IMD, very engaged business school, right? So it's, it's what I notice is it's extremely difficult for, um, say, administrators, the deans, the deans of, of research, deans of faculty, to make the switch because the, the system, existing system rewarded them. It's because of the existing system that they've become full professors, that they've become established scholars, that they are now, you know, enjoying all the academic freedom. So it, it's almost conflict of interest to them to go and change the entire incentive and award structure you know and and it's it's what i've observed it's also very difficult for them to do it first it's 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 like okay but if i do it then then we are going to be you know we are not going to be top research producing uh, institution anymore so so i think that everybody agrees yes we want to do good beyond academia, but it's just very difficult for them to make this switch. So how can we, how can we facilitate that? Because society has been calling for it for a very long time, actually, and business schools have been trashed and, and blamed of being irrelevant and, and whatnot. I mean, this has all been going on for many, many years, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I know that that tension and that battle is playing out at IMD, just as, <laughs> just as it's played out at HBS. Only, you see, only at IMD, it's like they've been very engaged. And then yeah. the research active schools would say, oh, but they are not re research, they are teaching. See the, yeah. the right, and then yeah. now IMD is trying to say, No, no, we do research too, and they're, they're, yeah, yeah, and we are yeah. now indeed, indeed, and now we are trying to. So, it's it's a very it's a very interesting play, yeah. It's a very yeah, you know, a couple of things in your comments the the idea that there are senior professors who have been rewarded by the existing system, they're therefore they're going to be hesitant to say that the system is wrong. There's a lot to say about that again. In Deb Meyerson's work on the tempered radical, what she found often is that those that conformed to the existing rules and sort of um, didn't deviate are the most, the most vociferous in defending them. And she, for example, women who break through the glass ceiling will defend the rules. I earn my bones. Why should I make it easier for you guys to do this? But there are enough to come forward and start to push. You know, Paul Pullman, he became a CEO and kept his radical side and, and really did some really interesting things that you would have thought he would not have made it to the top. And uh, the question of who goes first is a really good one because we're not, we're not rewarded for innovation. Um, you know, anytime I go to the Dean and say, we should do X, what's the first question? Are our peer schools doing it? Which makes us really amusingly conservative. It's crazy kind of how conservative, way. indeed, that's exactly so path dependent and conservative. While also, society ex ex yeah, expects innovation and yeah. solutions, right? Mm. Yeah. But also think about the rewards for doing it. Like, for example, I think that the curriculum in the business school, which is pretty uniform across business schools, is totally broken. Um, it's totally out of step. Yet, A, you know how much work it would be due to redo the curriculum? If someone's going to have to do it and it's going to cost them in the standard metrics of doing research, and the dean is going to take a risk because if they drop in the rankings and students don't come or your clients at IMD don't come, we're done. So they're so afraid, so afraid. But what you need is someone to step forward and, and do it and succeed. And all of a sudden people are going to run. And that's the goofy thing. But the tension you're describing, I, I've seen it. I, I have some friends at IMD. Uh, Omar Tulan is there. And, and please say hi to him. Um, and friends at Harvard and the battles, uh, the, the ones at Harvard, they leave some blood on the floor. You know, we still got to be that book oriented, practice oriented. No, we got to be the academic journal oriented. And, and they clash and they tried to create multiple career tracks where you could do one or the other. And that hasn't quite set. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting tension, but you know, we're talking about the realities of the inertia within institutions that are hard to undo. Yeah, and it, I, you mentioned it at, at, at one point, it is true that with younger scholars and also PhD candidates, right, they are demanding this yeah. engagement aspect. They, they, they don't want to do a PhD just so that they can, can push out uh, A star publications. They want to have the real impact they want to see the change that their work brings in in society so that's... and i would challenge everybody in the academic pursuit when it comes to your final days and you're looking at the end of your life you will not look back and think about your h index or your citation counts you will think about people you touched ideas you shared ways you made the world better that's what you'll think about and h index and citation counts they're not going to they're not going to give you satisfaction in those final moments. Andy, that reminds me, um, I suppose one of your aspirations for writing your book is that it ends up on the um, curriculum of the doctoral training program. And uh, maybe another book to, to include is uh, Christensen's How to Measure Your Life as well, alongside that. Yeah. Um, speaking of the doctoral, I think Molly had a question around that, but Hello, I just Jessica. want to give, give Molly a chance. Oh, I Molly, heard you. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Oh, fab. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew, for your time today. It's been really insightful. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm a new PhD student, so I started in February this year. Um, I'm based in the UK, and although, as Vicky says, you know, there has been sort of some progress as change is happening, it still very much seems like 
um, there's still an expectation to publish from a disinterested stance. So most journals are favouring value-free knowledge um, and that I guess the idea of engaged scholarship is reserved for people that are further on in their careers. I mean, I'm researching sustainability, so engaged scholarship, you know, feels more important than ever. Um, and I suppose my question is, you know, what can I do as a PhD student? You know, I feel like I need to be in the circle to be able to make those changes, but to get in that circle, you have to, you know, play the game as it were and publish papers. Um, and I know you sort of said before to somebody else that if you really don't want to fit that mold, then, you know, you could join a think tank or do something other than academia, but then it feels like if there's ever going to be significant change in academia, then we need, you know, young researchers who are going to inject that, like you've all just been saying, to inject that need for engaged scholarship. So I guess I don't want to give up on academia. I want to make that change, but how can I do it? And, you know, is there a way that I can incorporate even into my PhD, into my thesis, you know? I don't know how much my supervisors would like it. I don't well, but I mean, it, I don't, you know, your thesis has a different purpose. I don't mm -hmm. know the idea of working it into your thesis. The question for me would be, what are you going to do thesis when, with, with your thesis when it's done? And so I like the platform of academia. The, it, I fit here. It's not been easy. And I'm a bit of a, an odd duck. In, in, in my department, um, I'm okay with that. But I like the platform, you know, it gives you a certain legitimacy in society. And let's face the fact, for many of us, some of the biggest impact we will have will be in the classroom, touching young minds and sending them off. And on sustainability, I've got, you know, what, like 30 years of students that have gone through my classes and are now out many of them achieving great things. And that gives me great satisfaction. So those are the joys of being a professor to my mind. And so uh, recognize that anything worth having is gonna take some work. And so some of it's not gonna be pleasant. Uh, again, going back to Deb Myerson's idea on the tempered radical, you wanna be tempered, you wanna fit, you wanna succeed by the rules, you wanna be a radical, you wanna think differently. She recognizes in, in her work that there are some strategies necessary to do this. First of all, you have to cultivate both sides of you. So as you go through your doctoral program, don't shunt all interest in the real world aside. You need communities in both. I often tell my students, when you go off into the work world, join Green Drinks, join Sierra Club, whatever it is, find another way to cultivate that side of you where it will atrophy and it will die. So keep both sides alive while you're also recognizing that you're in an apprentice, apprentice program right now. And so you have to be able to prove that you have been apprenticed properly. And that is think like an academic and it's not easy. Not everyone can do it. And I'm sure you can, but it's gonna take some work. But don't, don't let that other side of you die, cultivate it and grow it through your career. You may choose to do some engagement activities. I can tell you the students that, joined, that formed that program called Relate that I talked about, most of them would not tell their advisors they were doing it because they didn't want their advisor criticizing them for doing it. I find that one of the challenges of where we are right now. I think that that happened like eight years ago. Maybe things have changed, maybe not. But right now you want to signal to your advisors that you're serious about being an academic. You're going to do the work, the hard work that's necessary. Again, going back to the piano analogy, if you were an aspiring pianist and you had a great pianist who was going to teach you and you said, I want to go do ragtime and the teacher teaches classical, they may say, why are you in my classroom? But if you need to learn the skills and the, the, the scales in order to maybe not ragtime, but jazz, whatever it is, learn your scales, but go do the nightclub and jazz at night and, and keep that side of you alive. And, 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 and I don't think it always has to be looked at as an additive thing, because I do think that the engagement work makes your research better, makes your questions more relevant. How many of you times have you seen a paper where just the initial question was like, I mean, what planet is this person on? That is such an obvious question. And it, it, it's helpful to have people push back and say, you know, uh, you can come up with a better question than that. And I think you're, 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 you're parking on sustainability, an issue that I care about deeply. I think that the relevance of that speaks to itself. Um, and so I think that 
it would be hard for you not to do relevant work in this empirical domain. Okay, thank you for your time. You're welcome.